Our third interview in this group is with a man named Jerry Batty, who's the director of a school called Eagles Academy. And it, it's a public high school, and the student body is made up of solely, almost solely, of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender high school students. What we do is to target primarily highly at-risk gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth. But uh, obviously being a public school system, we're open to youth for whom, any youth for whom it may uh, be a benefit. So we do in fact have uh, a straight youth uh, in our program who is a young mother. Uh, so we are there just to help get these kids uh, who are the most uh, unserved, shall we say, and disenfranchised youth in any school system. What have been your greatest joys with creating the school and running the school? The graduation in 1993 when one of about 75 people who uh, had attended came rushing up to me, a, a woman, and saying, oh, Jerry, Jerry, this is so wonderful. I can't imagine what it would be like to be graduating openly gay. But you know one thing the kids missed? They didn't get to have their prom. Said, you know, you're right. So come January the next year, when we'll be ready for the class of 94, I got my five little graduates together and I said, hey, guys, how would you like to have a prom? Oh, yo, yeah, Batty, that sounds great. That, that, that's good. And I said, okay, let's see. There are one, two, three, four, five of you, and each of you brings a date. That's 10. Oh, isn't that going to be a delightful prom? And their faces just fell. And I said, look, what if I went to the district and I convinced the district to allow us to open the prom to all gay and lesbian youth in the district? Yeah, Betty. So I did. And in 1994, we had the first uh, public school uh, sanctioned uh, prom in the world. And there were 350 students who attended, some of them from other school districts. It was incredible, it was magnificent. I did the first one and now I've let other people take over the others. You know, you, you quit while you're ahead. In our final uh, group of interviews, we label theory evolution. I mean, the theory of evolution is ultimately a theory of reproduction. You survive to reproduce. In our first interview, we have the world's leading bonobo researcher, Franz de Waal. He's a professor at Emory University. The bonobos are the monkeys who act as if they've read the joy of sex. Bonobos have um, sex at interesting moments, such as after a fight, as a reconciliation between two individuals, especially between females, that happens. They have sex when you introduce food. In captivity, when you give them food, that's actually the easiest way to get sexual behavior, and they use the sex to reduce tensions, and then they share the food afterwards. In the field, they report a lot of sex when bonobos enter a fruit tree, lots of food available, they have lots of sex, and then they eat the food without competition. So the sex sort of uh, irons out tensions that it may exist in relationships and makes it possible to share resources. Is this another form of altruism from an evolutionary function? It's interesting that bonobos, uh, when, they, when they have mutual sex, let's say two females do their famous GG rubbing, which is where, where they uh, have a, adopt a sort of mother-infant posture, the one female clings to the other female, and they rub their swellings together in a very rapid rhythm. Which, which are also the clitoris, actually. So the clitoris is stimulated at that point. In that case, they have mutual pleasure. So we don't need to talk about altruism because both of them get something out of it. But what is interesting because you of, often see also individuals stimulate each other without the stimulator getting anything out of it. So you may have a female who approaches another one and uh, fingers her genitals just for a few seconds, but still something that she's doing to the other one. Or you have males who suck each other's penis or who stimulate each other's penis. And in that sort of cases, it's much harder to argue that both of them get pleasure out of it. And so you could call it altruistic, or at least a sort of service prov provision of service there. People of often think that sex means the same sort of sex as we have, which, which lasts a long time. But a lot of the bonu bonobo sex is very short. Mm -hmm. It's like 10 seconds, sometimes less than 10 seconds. So it's a very brief encounter. And it's more similar maybe to, uh, in other primates, what is grooming. So I approach you, 
and I groom you for whatever, ten, 10 minutes, which is a service that I provide to you. Usually you find that pleasant and we actually have measures of uh, heart rate. Your heart rate will go down tw while I groom you. And so I don't think that's fundamentally different from one bonobo approaching on another and giving some small genital stimulation. And so in bonobos it's very likely, but no one has studied that, but it's likely that this sexual stuff plays a role in some sort of service economy. It's like I do something for you, you do something for me. And so if I'm the dominant male and I stimulate you, your genitals, maybe that means you're going to be more supportive of me. This idea of animal sex is just for reproduction and human sex is something else, I think is nonsense because animal sex has all these social functions as well. So I think that's the most important message. And maybe another message from the bonobo that we should learn is that some of the evolutionary modeling that has taken place which emphasizes warfare and aggressiveness and male dominance and all of this is based on a set of assumptions that I don't necessarily agree with and I think the bonobo is one of those species that upsets that sort of scenarios and we will hear a lot more about them once they're taken seriously by some of the establishment. And the final interview addresses the topic of evolutionary psychology which is how evolution has influenced male and female sexuality. And we use the anthropologist Don Simons again, who's also written a book about evolutionary psychology, to give us his insight into this phenomenon. If you want an epiphany, I think it was when I, I really, for the first time, read about homosexuals and realized how different lesbian behavior is from the behavior of gay men. And Suddenly, I, that was as close to an epiphany on this as, as I ever came because I realized that, that gay men are just men and lesbians are just women. And what you're seeing in gay male sex and in lesbian sex, respectively, is male sexuality and female sexuality unencumbered by compromising with the other sex. And what you mean by that is the frequency of partners, the frequency of sex, and sure. so forth. That, that it transcends sexual orientation. Men like sex with strangers it's attractive and women generally don't so but if you if you look at only the behavior of, of heterosexuals uh, it's impossible for men to be only having sex with strangers and women not because every time a man has a new partner there's got to be a woman who's having a new partner too so the numbers have got to add up they've got to be exactly the same for males and females so if you're just looking at behavior there, you can't really see much difference between heterosexual men and heterosexual women but if you look at gay men, that's not true. Because if, if men enjoy sex with strangers and you, you're having sex with other men, then you have the opportunity to, to have sex with strangers if that's what other men want. So you look at the number of partners and it turns out that gay men, at least in places like the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, the typical man will have sex with hundreds and often thousands of partners over a relatively brief span, which actually isn't that much sex if you think about it. If, if most of the sex you're having is with strangers, um, you have to have, if you're going to have much sex at all, you're going to have a lot of partners. And in the same study, this, this came out much later, a uh, scientific study uh, in the Bay Area, lesbians were behaving roughly like heterosexual women in terms of partner number, in terms of the duration of, of relationships, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, I don't know, but it, it, it was, it's roughly the same. And what that tell, tells me is that the reason that heterosexual males are not having sex all the time with strangers and sex in public restrooms and, and so forth is that women aren't interested in that kind of sex very often, at least not if they're not paid for it. And so that was a, I think that was sort of the, a light bulb went off then and things started to come together. Well, the curious thing about the example you use is that I mean, what was the prevailing notion of, of homosexuality then was it was a deviation from a heterosexual norm. To what way does it parallel, you know, what would be evolved gender-specific behavior? And I mean, once you do look at it and that that's way, looking outside the box. I guess. The I, I, didn't, I didn't think of it that way, but I, I suppose it was. Um, but lots of things fall into place then. If you look at, if you look at gay male porn, it's, uh, it's the same as, as straight male porn, except it's two men rather than males and, and females together. There, there's no difference. And one of the things this tells you, for example, is that there are lots of, uh, uh, of views of pornography that, that focus on 
male attitude towards females, that, that pornography is fundamentally revealing something about men's attitude towards women, contempt or lack of respect or, or something like that. Well, it's, it's possible, but here you've got a test case. If that were true, you would expect that gay male porn would be very different because you have men interacting with other men. But it's not. It's the same. And what that tells me is that uh, the basic message of, uh, of pornography, of mainstream video porn, is not that it reveals anything about men's attitude towards women. It reveals something about the essence of male sexuality. And that's one of the, the powerful uses, I think, of, of comparing gay and, and straight people. If you credit a male pattern of behavior to evolution, or that's in a certain adaptation, some people could take the perspective that, well, that's just a way of legitimizing you know, male insensitivity, male promiscuity, male whatever else. Um, that is something that's specific to the argument you make, and that's a reasonable reaction from a certain vantage point. But even the argument that it, that it somehow justifies male promiscuity is, is clearly wrong. And I can remember even back in the 70s, teaching a seminar in which I was talking about these kinds of things. and one of the male students said, well, this is, this is great, and women should know about this so, so they'll know why their husbands are behaving this way. And a, a perceptive woman student in the class said, all they'll know is that men are doing this because they want to, and they already knew that. And she's right. How do you know where to end? How do you know where to stop a video on sexuality? Well, it's funny you should ask that. We didn't know where to stop because we had so many other topics and so many other people lined up that we end this with to be continued. I know for myself as, as a single dad with small girls, I went out and bought lipstick, nail polish, had all this stuff around, went to Goodwill, <laughs> bought fur coats, um, high heel shoes, just left Is around. Is that for there. you or the kids? Well, it was for them. <laughs> Ostensibly it was for them. Under the umbrella of having fun, does it also include having sex and same sex? Well, during church. No, no, <laughs> not during church. Even with, the, with my best friends among the primates, I pay very close attention, but some people are distracted, they look around, and it's done before they know it. And they'll just come and bite the finger right off. Yeah, yeah, that's the specialty of the great apes. And so uh, if you go to a conference on great apes, you will meet some people. Primatologists without <laughs> yeah. fingers. <laughs> yeah, that's sad.
How do students find your school? I mean, do you actively recruit in high schools? <laughs> Don't use the word recruit. Not in our community. Where's the love? Come on, let's go. This is love. Good shot. Good, that's what it put together. Put it together. Let's go. Let's see the heart grow. Let the heart grow. Oh, oh, oh.